Hello everybody and welcome to Flock Talk. Today we're going to be going over some mistakes that are really easy for beginner bird owners to make. So the first thing we're going to cover is cage sizing. Now when you are first getting your bird, whether that be from a rescue or from a store, you will frequently see them in cages that are quite small and most of the cages that are available to purchase in that moment are quite small as well. And if you are an unsuspecting new bird owner who is taking the advice of a pet store attendant or just believing what is said on the packages, you will often believe that this is an adequate cage size for your bird. The reality is that most cages you will find in North American stores at least are minimum cage size requirements. And what this basically means is that it's only suitable for your bird to really be sleeping in. It's not something they're supposed to be contained in for long hours of time. So if you go to work or school, it's not going to be adequate for your bird. When it comes to North American cage sizes and regulations, there are very few regulations in place. So what this means is that when you are looking up what an adequate cage size is and you are getting the minimum cage size requirement, that cage basically just means that it can contain the bird with it still having freedom of movement, meaning that it is able to stretch out both of its wings and turn around without contacting the walls of the cage. Um, usually most cities or states will have some regulations regarding the amount of movement an animal must have within their containment and the number of hours that that animal is expected to be contained within that carrier. And so in the case of bird cages, you will frequently find that the minimum cage size requirements are only suitable for a bird to be housed in for a couple of hours. Because parrots are so new to captivity, we do not have sufficient studies on their cognitive capacities and the effects of small containment on them. As a result, it is not a illegal for companies to sell you cages that are too small. This is of course different for every single country that there is and there are many European countries that have much better laws when it comes to animal care and maintenance but in North America in general the laws are pretty subpar. A lot of the time you will find that birds kept in small cage sizes will exhibit a lot of stereotypic behaviors. Stereotypic behaviors are behaviors that you may witness when a bird or an animal is under severe stress. This can be things like swaying back and forth, plucking and ripping out their feathers, other forms of self-mutilation, pulling at their toes, chewing at the bars, racing along the bottoms of the cage. There are a lot of behaviors you may find to acknowledge that a cage is too small and that is putting a bird under a lot of mental distress. So minimum cage size requirements can be a good base guideline for you to understand what the absolute minimum is, meaning that this is an area that the bird will be sleeping in overnight or only being contained for a couple of hours at a time. If you are going to work or school full time and the bird is going to be in there for up to eight hours, then we need to start considering the amount of activity that a parrot would typically have within that time period. So when you are picking a cage size for the amount of time that you are going to be gone, you want to be considering how much that species is likely to be moving around, how many activities they need to keep them occupied, how much foraging they would do during that period of time, and you can begin to take into account how much space you're going to need for all of those enrichment items you're going to have to also be able to fit in that cage along with the physical exercise requirements that they will require while you are gone. A general rule of thumb, if you are going to go away for long hours during the day, is to get the largest cage that you can afford. And that's a very vague statement, believe me, I understand, but it very much is the truth. The largest you can give your bird is going to be the best for them that gives them the most space to exercise and move them around, gives them the most toys and enrichment activities you can fit in there, and it makes them feel less cramped and distressed and like they're really being contained. Some other rules you can keep in the back of your head when looking for a cage size is that the bird should be able to fully spread their wings without having it contact either side of the bars, and you want them to be able to make at least a couple flaps from one end of the cage to the other, and that the length of the cage is more important than the height. While some vertical space is necessary in order for a bird to feel safe up high, what is far more important is their capacity to get some flaps in in order to properly exercise when you are not home. A cage that is really narrow on the sides but super tall doesn't really allow for any flight to occur and that can result in a very overweight bird, a bird that is lacking in their cardiac health, and one that is overly just not very healthy. Since they don't have the space to flap and fly, they are not getting adequate exercise during that long eight hour period. They will be climbing and foraging a lot for sure and we're not going to discount the benefits that that can have, but the exercise will be pretty small. Carrying off of that, when you buy your first cage, they will frequently come with these long, thin dowel perches. They're very, very smooth, they're uniform in size, and they're just a straight line from point A to point B. So it's really understandable to see that and think that that is a 
normal perch for a parrot to have. When you think of a perch and you're new to birds for the first time, a dowel is kind of the first thing you think of. It's a pretty standard flat object that you will see a lot of parrots online sitting on, especially the ones on the cover of that cage box or in advertisements around the store. You will frequently see those plain dowel perches. However, I do need to bring the bad news here and say that dowels are really, really bad when it comes to your bird's foot health. Parrots can't get off their feet. They will sleep on their feet. They cannot sit down. They are always standing, whether that be on one foot or both. And for that reason, they need ways to be able to relieve pressure from the bottoms of their feet. If you were to walk around on cement for a really long, flat period of time, your feet would get really, really tired and sore, and eventually you would sit down to relieve that pressure. Parrots don't have that capacity. So what they need instead is perches that are of different textures, different widths, and that sit at different angles. So that way the pressure that is on the perch is on a different part of their foot all throughout the day. These natural wood perches, or even ones that are made of rope, can be really beneficial in allowing your bird that little bit of cushion and reduction of pressure. Additionally, dowel wood perches tend to be extremely smooth, and if you have ever played on a playground with the monkey bars, you will remember getting blisters and sores all across the heel of your hand, that part of your palm. And that's because it's a really slick, smooth surface that is rubbing across and putting a lot of pressure on that part of your hand. It will do the exact same thing to your parrot's foot, and you can end up with a condition called bumblefoot. This condition can be extremely painful for your bird, and they can't get off their feet. So they will end up with a lot of sores and bumps and redness, potentially even infections, that they can't relieve their pressure from. Now that isn't to say that dowel perches are completely evil. If you have a couple in your cage, it's not the end of the world. However, you do want to make sure that you have variety. If the only thing in there is flat plain dowel perches, you're going to run into problems. But if you have a couple dowel perches and a couple natural perches and a couple that are a little bit softer, maybe some platforms, even a swing, those will all work together to create a more dynamic footing for your bird. Toto is a prime example of this. He came to me with extremely sore feet because he did not have proper perches in his cage. He would not even grip his feet down to hold onto my finger when I asked him to step up because it hurt too much to be able to close his feet. You may not notice those little things at first. You might not even notice for a long time, but it does eventually lead to more concerning health problems down the road and perches are the easiest way to resolve those problems. Next in line is their diet. And this is honestly a pretty controversial one as far as the parrot community goes. But parrots in captivity do not get as much exercise as their wild counterparts and as such do not do well on super fatty seed-based diets. So this is another case where when you first go into a pet store, you may see the birds there. Do you want help? This is another case where if you go into the pet store and you see the birds in their cages, they might be getting fed seeds or they might be getting fed extremely bright and colorful pellets with funky shapes and silly things like that and your instinct will be to buy that exact food. And in the moment, you will need to buy at least one bag of the food that the bird is already on, because the bird is unlikely to quickly transition onto a new food, and it can actually be harmful to their systems to quickly throw them onto something new. Dietary transitions do need to happen slowly, and most parrots just simply will not eat a food that they do not recognize. So what can often happen is you will pick up a bag of whatever food the bird was already eating at the store or at the breeder or the rescue, wherever you got them from, and you'll just keep them on that food for life and you won't really give it a second thought. And it's not unusual for that to happen. Sometimes it falls to the back of your mind or you just think they're doing fine, it doesn't matter, and never really give it a second thought. However, bird diets are very complicated. And I say that because every single bird will do better on a different food and not all foods are created equal. And the pellets that you will find in stores are often ones that are completely not suitable for parrots at all and there are a lot of things to consider. So when you are bringing home a new bird and you have bought that first bag of food, look at the ingredients. You might not even know what you're looking at at first, but just look at it and see what you find, and then look at other brands that you have available to you and see if you can notice any differences. In general, in general, most parrots will need food that has the first four ingredients or so being wholesome, hearty grains. So this isn't corn and this isn't soy. You are looking for things like barley, maybe even some wheat or some oats. You would even accept wholesome seeds like millet or canary grass seeds. 
things like that that are hardy that are whole seeds. You don't want to see fillers like corn or soy on the first few ingredients because there just isn't a lot of nutrition to them. The reason why manufacturers use that product in there is because it's often a food that parrots will really like. If you have ever offered a bird some canned corn or something, they will gobble it down. It is usually a fan favorite. So when they add corn into their food, it's a bit of a flavor enhancer. The birds will take to it quickly. That will make you happy and you will buy more. Unfortunately, parrot nutrition is very questionable at best at the moment. There are basically zero studies that show what nutrition parrots actually need. A lot of the data they're using to formulate parrot foods comes from data we have on chickens. We know next to nothing on what a wild parrot actually consumes in a day and what vitamins they actually need to survive. In general, a pellet-based diet does tend to be the most popular choice for parrots. You're looking for a pellet that is usually neutral in color and isn't made in a bunch of funny shapes. You are just looking for a pellet that has wholesome seeds as the first few ingredients, and then either has a bunch of fruits and vegetables added in for their nutrition, or has fortified vitamins added in to cover their nutritional bases. When you are feeding something like a plain seed-based diet, there are quite a few problems that can happen if it's not done correctly. The first problem, and the one that does have a lot of studies on it, is that parrots don't know what's best for them nutritionally. If you serve them a plate of a variety of different foods, they will pick out whichever is the fattiest or the sugariest in that moment. They are not able to realize that they are lacking a certain vitamin or nutrient and eat the food that's going to fulfill that need. There were studies done where the birds were deprived of a certain nutrient and then they provided them a food with the nutrient next to one that was lacking in it and they always chose the one that was lacking in the thing that they actually needed. So when you are feeding a seed-based diet, you have a variety of different seeds there your bird's gonna pick and choose the things that they want, and they are going to ignore the ones that they don't. And that means they're gonna eat the fatty, fatty sunflower seeds, the safflower seeds, and they're gonna ignore the things that might have more nutritional value in them. So while a seed-based diet might be more natural by perspective, it can be very dangerous, especially when we're working with captive birds that don't have birds around them to help show them how to properly forage and fulfill their nutritional needs. On top of this, if you are feeding a seed-based diet, you need to be formulating it with all of the base nutrients that are presumed to be required for them. And this is usually through the form of vitamins and vegetables. And unfortunately, that is extremely difficult to do, especially when you are new to birds for the first time. You are not going to be able to find all the information on how to fortify the proper nutrients for them right out the gate. It's going to take a little bit of time for you to figure that out. And it's probably going to take working with a specialized veterinary nutritionist, which is not something that most new bird people want to do when they've only just got this new bird and they don't even realize that this is even something that exists yet. So while it is totally possible to have a bird on a seed-based diet and formulate it yourself with the help of a veterinary nutritionist, it is very, very delicate. And there are a lot of spots for you to make mistakes and errors and miss out on essential nutrients. There's a lot of ways to mess up. Whereas when you are using a pellet, it is already fortified for you. It already has all of those nutritional bases. And then you just throw in some extra vegetables for some extra add-ins and for some enrichment. It's a lot less complicated. There's a lot less room for error. And there's a lot less chance of accidentally making your bird overweight or sick. Something that is often overlooked and is potentially most important when it comes to taking care of a new bird is locating a certified avian vet. And this should honestly be done before you add a bird to your family because not every place even has one. Parrots are so unique that their blood cells are not even the same shape as most other animals. And that's just one of the millions of things that makes parrots so delicate and different from any other species that most vets will work with. And what this means is that your standard vet that will see your dog and your cat or an exotics vet that typically treats reptiles cannot properly treat a parrot. Most exotics vets will still take them as patients, but they will not have the proper knowledge and background in order to properly treat your bird in comparison to a vet that is properly trained in avian medicine. And this is no easy feat. Avian vets can be pretty hard to come by. They usually have very long waiting lists and they are definitely expensive. And that's honestly why I always recommend checking to see that one is in your location first. You can easily check if a vet is near your location by using the search feature on the Association of Avian Veterinarians website. And from there, you can easily enter in your location and they will 
show you what vets are available in your state or in your country, in your province, and then from there you can figure out which one's going to work best for you. Not having an avian vet can mean the difference between life and death for your bird, and if you are considering something like an emergency happening and you do not have an avian vet nearby, what is your game plan? What are you going to do? Because if you have to drive several hours to get there and your bird is in the middle of having a stroke, you got nowhere to go, right? So it's really important to make sure that you have that resource available so when something bad happens, you are able to be prepared and so that you have a reliable person that you know has the knowledge and the research and the information to be able to back you up and take care of your bird and help you out with full confidence. Now this might be a little bit controversial, but what I'm gonna say as the last thing here that is a common mistake is rushing to get a second bird. And let me explain. Whether it be when you're in the store and some unsuspecting store owner tells you that birds need to be in pairs, or you are at home and kind of reading about their social aspect and how a second bird could be beneficial, there are a lot of ways for you to feel like you need to get a second one. And this can go wrong in a lot of ways. Even though the information you're reading isn't necessarily wrong, there are absolutely a lot of benefits to having more than one bird. There are a lot of social aspects to it, a lot of mental health aspects to it. There are a lot of things that a second bird can provide, and there are definitely some species that do thrive better with the presence of a second bird. However, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. Unfortunately, adding a second bird to your flock isn't as easy as just buying another bird, sticking them in the same cage, and then they'll be just friends. Even just letting them kind of see each other for a week and then slowly moving them in together. That's simply not how it works in most cases, and that can end in death. Quite plainly. Although most parrots are social creatures, birds raised in captivity in most cases have next to no social skills. They are often taken from their nests really, really young. They aren't raised in flock settings. They don't get to learn those critical communication skills that would help them be able to socially bond with another bird and communicate without conflicts. Additionally, in captivity, we have very limited space. When we are talking about a very social flock of animals, like say budgies, they have acres upon acres of land for them to space out and this makes reducing conflicts really easy if budgie number one and budgie number two don't like each other it's easy for them to go separate ways and not need to fight to the death in order to reserve their territory or their space or resolve whatever conflict they're having when you're in a house or god forbid contained in the same small cage and they have a small conflict and they can't move away to escape that problem you're putting them in a situation where flight versus the fight or flight instinct is no longer there and they're stuck only fighting until they're able to either end their conflict, one bird ending up seriously injured, or one losing their life. And most new bird owners don't believe me when I say that one budgie can outright kill another budgie. Birds can and will rip the beaks off of each other. It is nasty and gnarly and they can be quite territorial and vicious. If you don't know how to manage territory resources, if you don't know how to properly introduce birds, and if you don't know the demeanor and reactions that your existing birds will have, you do not know that these birds will even want to get along. Unfortunately, when it comes to captivity, there are a lot of aspects missing from what you would typically see in their wild counterparts. And that can make integrating multiple birds into one space very difficult and complicated. And oftentimes, even if you have a very good knowledge of bird body language and behavior, even if you put everything you've got into it, into teaching them how to be friends and respecting their spaces and having separate resources and all of that great stuff, some birds simply do not like other birds. <laughs> That's as simple as it is. Birds are as unique as you and me. We are uniquely different people. We have different personalities. We have different likes and interests. And parrots are the exact same way. And for that reason, they won't mesh with every single bird you try and introduce them to. So when you go to the store and you buy a random bird and you bring them home, there's a big chance that they just won't like that particular bird or that your bird in particular isn't as hypersocial because of the influences of being raised in captivity. Now this isn't for me to completely discourage you from ever getting a second bird. There's absolutely value in multiple birds living in one home, provided you have a bird that is open to sharing that home and that you have the knowledge and resources to be able to properly train them to cooperate and solicit healthy interactions from them. However, I think it's extremely important for new bird owners and anyone considering multiple birds to understand all the risks that can come with it and that there are regulations and protocols that kind of have to be in place for a long while 
while the birds figure out whether or not they're going to get along. And this isn't the case for some birds. Some you will bring a new bird in, they'll be really excited for a new friend, and that'll be that. They'll get along really well, they'll still retain great social skills, and it'll be bread and butter and beautiful, and I'm super happy that that can happen for those birds. But for a lot of people, that simply just isn't the case. And it's important to recognize that there is always the possibility that those birds will not get along. And in those situations, you need to be able to provide for them. There can't be resentment for the second bird because they didn't provide the emotional help and regulation that you wanted them to provide for your existing bird. You need to be able to have that separate cage and enclosure. You need to have enough time for two separate birds, two separate cleanings, two separate cages all of those resources, all of those toys and things that you'll now have to be spending money on and the vet bills and all of that stuff. So while it is extremely tempting and can be beneficial to have multiple birds, it's really important to recognize that risks still exist even in what is typically a very social animal. So that will do it for me today. Let me know what you guys think of this list and feel free to add on any things that you feel I missed on this little video here. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.